Sure. Tell me your name one more time. Oh, great, great boss. Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have Greg Foss here with us today, who's going to go over attacking Drupal. Hey, everyone. Well, he said, I'm uh, Greg Foss. I'm a senior security research engineer with uh, Logarithm Labs. And uh, so today, I want to talk to you guys about how to hack uh, Drupal applications. So let's jump right in. So what is Drupal? Why, why do we want to go after Drupal? So Drupal is an uh, open source content management framework uh, written in PHP. Um, basically runs on a basic LAMP stack, really easy to use, really easy to install. And that's part of why uh, there's such a large adoption of it. So government agencies are using it, major companies are using it, and it's very easy to use. So it's just growing in popularity, essentially. Um, so why is it a good target? Well, this slide actually took, uh, oh, that better? Let's hear me better. All right, so this slide, I actually took a picture of at a, at a conference a couple weeks ago, and this is a Drupal presentation they were giving. This is a government agency actually talking through their Drupal deployment process. And so it's kind of funny up here. Like you see, customer requests a site, they provision the site for them, then customer builds the content on the site, they provision a production site from this content, web team syncs the content from pre-prod to prod, new site's live. So what's the issue with this? with this basic SDLC diagram here. There's no security at all. It wasn't even uh, thought. And so I asked them about this, and what they said was that uh, they rely on the Drupal security team and the community for security. And so I was like, really? Like, that's your security plan? And he's like, well, we run scans, too. Well, that's cool. We run scans, but Scans against Drupal applications don't work all that well. So if anyone in here has ever tried to run like AppScan or HP Web Inspect or something like that against a Drupal application, you can run into issues where, say, if they have a calendar or something like that, it'll actually end up scanning infinitely because it thinks there's an infinite number of pages, never finishes. And so you end up not getting any really good results from scanning. So that's why you have to actually manually pen test these, manually review code, and do things like that. So what I'm trying to do is automate some of this, but still you know, have scanning be like more smart scanning. So you're doing it intelligently, fuzzing certain fields, things like that, as opposed to just blanket running a tool against something, crossing your fingers, and, and hoping it's going to work, right? So first thing you can do, and I use this all the time, uh, so Drupal comes with a changelog.txt file. Now, Drupal teams who are developing sites, they often collaborate. So they work in, you know, there'll be like five to 20 people working on one site. And they always use this, this text file to essentially document what changes they've made to the site. So you can visit this one file and find out, you know, versions of modules, what modules are installed, what version core is at, you know, all sorts of things like that without ever running a scan. You can find out just by visiting one page, which isn't going to trigger any alarms, uh, essentially, on the organization you're targeting. So if you are going to do any scanning, uh, I, I highly suggest these two tools. Um, very useful. The first one is CMS Explorer. And essentially what this does is it goes out and it scans the site and it just looks for what modules are installed. And the cool thing is you can type this into the OS VDB and it checks those modules against the open source vulnerability database to see if there are any vulnerabilities for these modules out there. The issue is that it doesn't tell you the version. So you could say, oh, there's tons of vulnerabilities for these, but they're probably for older versions of the modules. So that's where Blind Elephant comes into play. So you can use Blind Elephant to essentially fingerprint the modules and also tell you the versions that they're running. And then you can correlate that with open source vulnerability database. So really, really useful tool. So the next thing I like to do is use the source code. So the neat thing about Drupal is, uh, this working. I think my mic went out. You guys hear me over here? Oh. Hello? Okay, that's better. All right, so maybe I'll just hold it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Is back? All right. Is that good? You guys hear me still? Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's jump ahead here. So 
with uh, source code, a lot of developers like to use GitHub. So the neat thing about GitHub is you can use uh, some dynamic queries similar to Google Dorks um, to find neat snippets of code that people have posted, even if uh, they've removed it since then or, or updated the repo. Um, so one tool I like to, I like to use to kind of automatically go through and scan this is called a GitHub hack. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially looking for the Drupal hash salt string within any PHP file. And I'm just storing the, re the results in a file called db.txt. So right here, I actually just ran this against GitHub. And all these sites um, are essentially exposing the backend MySQL credentials to their databases. And we'll talk about settings.php file here in a second. So you can also scrape an internal GitHub deployment with this same tool. You just have to change this one string right here. So the settings.php file essentially controls how the uh, site interacts with the database and also controls authentication. And so right here, we can see by looking at this file, we got the database user, the database username, password, uh, the host, and also the Drupal hash salt, which will come in very handy a little later on. So remediation is simple for this. You just have to essentially install a uh, .gignore file. So that's enough with source code, because there's a lot out there on source code analysis, especially with working with Drupal and security. So what I want to talk about is actually breaking live applications and hacking Drupal applications that are running. So, um, so we're essentially going to look at flaws in applications. So bugs would be, you know, I'm sending this input and it's not being filtered properly, resulting in you know, cross-site scripting or something like that. Like the, uh, the characters aren't being escaped. Whereas the flaw is you configured the site wrong, essentially. And so we're going to look at some ways to exploit some of these. So the first thing I like doing, if you're an internal security guy, and say you're auditing Drupal websites, uh, but the Drupal developers won't give you an admin account on the site to go and check permissions and, and those kind of things, you can use this nifty little trick here. So all you have to do is change directories to the doc root of the Drupal site and run the command drush uli. Now this uh, relies on the fact that they're using drush, which most every Drupal developer uses drush because it automates a lot of their processes. So once you run this, it gives you a nice little link that you can visit, which resets the admin's password. So a nifty little way to get in if you already have server access. So the next thing I want to look at is authentication and enumerating user accounts. So this is actually petitions.whitehouse.gov. Um, and you can enumerate users very easily from this site. And this is pretty much all Drupal sites have the same vulnerability by default. So when you enter a wrong username, it tells you right here, this user account doesn't exist in the database. Now when you enter the right one, says it's sent instructions to your email address. So pretty useful, though this does flag because you're going to be sending an email to the admin of the site if that's the account you're targeting. So there are other ways to do this. You can also go through and just iterate through accounts by changing the number up here. Most all Drupal app, uh, developers don't change this setting. Um, also comments, posts, things like that all contain the uh, user account name. So once you have that, um, well, right here, you can actually do a uh, uh, simple for loop to essentially use curl and go through and scrape all this data. So now we have every single user account in the site, right? So once we have this, you have essentially half of the equation that you need to break into the site. So what's the next logical step? Dictionary attack, right? We're going to take those accounts and we're going to try and brute force some of them. So pretty easy. Anyone here use Burp Suite? Yeah, great tool, especially for brute forcing. Uh, Drupal 6, by default, has no built-in protections against this. So you can just run as many attempts as you want and essentially gain access to the accounts. Now, one thing I like doing is using Hydra and using a word list in combination with the uh, usernames that you just scraped. So then you can go after multiple accounts. Uh, really good if someone you know sets a default password or something like that and they never log in and change it. Um, unfortunately, Drupal 7, they've added some default security. So uh, if, you, if you try and do this against a Drupal 7 site, by default, it will block you out after five failed attempts. So you know, not all is lost, though. Another way to get around this is just running three or four attempts against each account. And this works all the time, especially if you target a manager or something like that, because oftentimes developers set up accounts for their bosses, and their boss never actually logs into the site to check it out, but they always request an admin account. 
So you use something like Change Me or Company One Two Three Four or something like that works all the time. So the problem, though, is if you keep doing this, is it'll eventually ban your IP address. And there's no way to get around this unless you want to wait 30 days to be unblocked. So you know that's where Tor and VPNs and stuff like that come in. Well, one way to mitigate this, there are lots of ways, you know, single sign-on, AD integration, stuff like that. But one way that's very popular to uh, remediate against this is uh, CAPTCHA. Now, there is a major issue with the implementation of CAPTCHA in Drupal. Now, by default, a lot of times I've seen sites set up with the very bottom setting here that says, omit challenges on all forms once the user successfully responds to any challenge on the site. So you just have to answer the question right one time and then go back to brute forcing. So pretty bad. So you always want to make sure to always add a challenge if you're, if you're using CAPTCHAs. So next thing is session handling. So Drupal 6 by default has no security of their session tokens, really. So we can see the secure flag's not, not set and the HTTP only flag's not set. So pretty bad. You know, secure flag keeps your, your session from being transmitted when you're making HTTP requests. Whereas HTTP only protects your session token from JavaScript and, and cross-site scripting kind of attacks. Uh, Drupal 7, though, actually does set the HTTP only flag by default. So that's pretty good. Um, and it's supposed to set the secure flag. But every implementation I've seen has not actually set this flag. And it's usually because they set them up in clustered environments. They'll have like 10 sites running on one server. And setting the secure flag for one site will break the other ones and vice versa. So oftentimes, you'll never see the secure flag set. Session handling, you, know, you always want to encrypt all your traffic, even internally. A lot of developers say, oh, it's internal. It's OK. It's like, that's cool. You're using 80 credentials to log into your account, and I just stole them. It's like, that's bad. Anyone in the company can do these kind of things. So you want to you encrypt your traffic. Applying updates is another key thing that developers don't, don't like to do, it seems. Um, so in Drupal, whenever you have missing updates, it'll tell you on every single page that you have an update available. Uh, you get this big red warning banner. And there are also RSS feeds, email lists, all sorts of different ways to get notifications of updates. So there's really no excuse for missing out on major security updates. The next thing is application logging. So a lot of people bring in, you know, their Apache logs, their server logs, those kind of those kind of logs, and you know they think they're seeing the whole picture. Well, with Drupal, it actually uses what's called Watchdog, and it's a database where it stores the logs. So it actually gives you a whole uh, better picture of what's actually happening on the Drupal site if you're able to tie in to the database and pull those logs. And that's one of the things we do at Logarithm is we have a module that goes out and it pulls this data for our customers. They can alert on unique events specific to Drupal and WordPress and you know, similar applications. And the key is pulling these logs off. As long as you get these logs off the server, so they're somewhere backed up and safe that you know, the attacker can't easily get to, then the, the attacker can't go in and do this. Clear your log messages with a button. It makes it super easy as a, as a hacker. Just, oh, clear all evidence I just broke into your site, essentially. Now, authorization is the next piece I kind of want to touch on with, uh, in regards to what permissions users have. So users are often allowed to comment on articles and things like that on Drupal applications because they're, they want to be a community. They want to be open. They want to share information, things like that. So what they do oftentimes is set filtered HTML to allow people to comment, but they want to have them be able to bold text and stuff like that. That you, I mean, you really don't need in a comment field. This one in particular is from a real pen test I was doing, and they actually allowed, I don't know if you can see it, but the iframe tag. So it's bad, right? You can do anything you want with an iframe tag. And so essentially when I asked them about this, they said they wanted uh, people to be able to embed movies. It's pretty bad. And so this stuff's really common. So it ends up with things like this. You inject you know, funny things in their site. Like I like doing the little pancake bunny. It's pretty fun. Um, but cross-site scripting, you can do a lot of nasty stuff with cross-site scripting. Um, and, that's, and it's persistent, too. Whereas themes can often result in uh, reflected cross-site scripting. And reflected is not as much of a risk because you have to socially engineer someone into clicking the link and stuff like that. But persistent is everywhere in Drupal applications. And I'll show you some more attacks on persistent, uh, using persistent cross-site scripting here soon. 
So the next thing is unrestricted file uploads. So if you're allowing people to upload PHP files, that's just bad in general on any application. Um, you know, you can also upload PDFs or something like that if you want to attack users. So a lot of people, they don't want to mess with limiting the file extensions that are allowed. So they'll often put the star there under permitted file extension. So you can upload anything. And if you can upload it and access it, so you upload a PHP file, access that PHP file, you have a shell essentially, right? So one of the things the Drupal security team did is they tried to fix it. They tried to patch this uh, just back in November of 2013. And what they did is they just put an HT access file that permits the execution of PHP files from the, uh, the slash files directory which essentially is the default directory that files are uploaded to when you, when you configure uh, file uploads on a Drupal application. The issue is that custom applications often allow users to upload files to many different locations. So say they aren't uploading to the files directory. Well, now they upload a PHP file and can execute it and get a shell. So they didn't actually fix this issue. They tried to, but uh, the only way to really fix it is do it at the top level. You, you know, put it in the, in the root of the site instead of just the, uh, the files directory. The next thing I want to talk about is development modules. And more specifically, developers using these modules and leaving them enabled in production. And how we can lever the, leverage these to attack the application. Because these should always be removed prior to, you know, the site being promoted from dev to test to production. So the module we're picking on is Devel. So anyone here mess with Drupal and use Devel before? It's a nifty module. It uh, essentially will show you every single database detail of what you're displaying within the application on the page. So, so you bring up a user account, and it shows you all the back-end database info it has on that user account. And I'll show you here in a minute why that is so, so bad. So right here, we're looking at the uh, administrative users page, same way we were, we were essentially in, uh, enumerating users earlier. We're just looking at his account. And you can see by pulling up the Devel menu here, and this is a real pen test. They actually gave me a button. They didn't even notice other users could ac access this when they logged in. Um, but essentially, you can see I'm looking at the admin account here. And there's their password hash. So disclosed right there. I mean, it's, it's as simple as you click on this button and then click another button and you have their password hash. So I saw this so common um, when I was pen testing Drupal applications that I ended up scripting the extraction of the usernames and the password hashes. Um, just because every single site I was testing had this still enabled and had it accessible to basic users, which is really bad. So once we get those password hashes, how do we crack them? Right? So John the Ripper, it actually still works great. It's an awesome tool for this. So it has a built-in permutation for Drupal 7. All we need to supply is the salt. And it will actually still work and still crack password hashes even without the salt. It's just a lot faster if you have the salt. And Drupal 6 is just straight MD5. So super easy to, easy to crack. Really, really simple. So right here is just a screenshot showing a uh, dump, essentially after running the script that I'm going to show you here in a few minutes um, against a Drupal site. And so we have the email address and the password hash here. And so we take this, this uh, list of users and passwords and run it through John the Ripper. And it goes and cracks all of them. Pretty, pretty simple. The next neat thing that you can do with Debel, this is why it's my favorite module, is you can execute PHP code directly from within the module on the server. So once you can do that, you can read files on the host, you can you know, get a shell, you can do whatever you want. And it makes it very easy. And it just gives you a nice little PHP code execution window to use. And um, so if you don't see the window, you can just go to slash devel slash PHP, and then you can execute PHP code. And essentially right here, this is another real pen test I was on, and they had no idea that this was even a feature of Debel. And right here, we're getting a reverse shell out through an internal site or through an external site back to another server. So what I want to do now is kind of do a demonstration of actually hacking a live uh, Drupal application. And so we'll just kind of walk through the whole process. So first thing we need to do is register an account.
So now that we have the, an account registered, we can go through and start enumerating users. So we'll get logged in here. And so we're just going to our account, and then we'll just change to user 10, see if it changes. So, And there are ways to disable this. Um, I'll show you at the end. There's a link to uh, my GitHub, and I have a longer version of this talk that talks a lot more about remediation type stuff. Um, so here, I'm just writing this little script um, that essentially is going to go and, and extract all or uh, enumerate all the users, and then it's going to run a brute force attack against them. So we're just plugging in our session variables because it's going to use the session that we're already logged into the application with. So it's going to just use our same existing account. So we're just plugging in parameters here, laying out an HTTP site, so it's not a SSL enabled. And so we're going after 10 accounts. So right there, we've already enumerated 10 accounts, and now we're just launching Hydra to launch a brute force attack against them. So pretty quick. Um, for the demo, I mean, I just use the same passwords that are in the database already, just you know, for speed reasons. But in production, I've had a lot of success running this, especially against older sites. The cool thing about Drupal 6 is these are going to be around for a long time because a lot of companies don't have the money to upgrade to Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 is still being worked on. So there's the Drupal 6 is going to be around for a long time. Now you can do the same attack with Drupal 7, but it's a little trickier. So next, you know how we were talking about persistent cross-site scripting. Uh, so here I want to show some, uh, some nifty little cross-site scripting attacks you can do with uh, persistent XSS within Drupal specifically. Because uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll do a pen test and you just get the alert box and show that to the developer, but that really doesn't sink into them. They're just like, oh, you showed me an alert box. What's that mean? So what I like doing is actually attacking users and actually attacking the site and really showing them how damaging this can be. So the first attack I'm going to do here, this is against a Drupal 6 site because it won't work against Drupal 7 due to the HTTP only flag. But what we're going to do is essentially steal the session token of the, uh, of the administrative user. Now one of the funny things, a lot of Drupal admins have told me, you know, well, you're, uh, you're essentially, I, I have to review comments before they're posted, so you can't really attack users that way. And it's like, that's perfect because I'm getting the exact person I want to view this to click on it, essentially. So you don't need you know, all the other users, because that just causes congestion. So it's even better when you have it limited like that. So we just had our netcat listener up to catch the session token, essentially, when it was sent back to us. So here, we're just going to change our own token in our uh, you know, attacker uh, browser here. So once we hit save and close, we essentially now have the same permissions as the administrator. So it's as simple as that. Very easy attack. Now, next one's probably probably one of my favorite Metasploit modules. Anyone use the uh, the JavaScript keylogger? This one works really well. So essentially, we're just uh, generating our uh, our handler here. And now we're logging in with our test user, so essentially the attacker that we're going to be attacking the other uh, admin with. And so we're just adding a new comment. You know, same, same kind of attack as before. So now all we really have to do is point our script to the new Metasploit uh, JavaScript keylogger that's been generated. So we'll just copy this over here. All right, so now our code is embedded in there. And you know, again, when they view it, they don't see anything fishy unless they're looking at the source code. So now we're back on our victims browser session. And you can see we've hooked their browser once they've hit this page. And whatever they type anywhere in this page is picked up by the, Metis by the uh, JavaScript keylogger. So it works really well, especially in production. It's neat to see this populate you know, as tons of people are hitting the site. Pretty fun. The next um, 
attack kind of demonstration is just to show how, uh, how unique you can get with, with cross-site scripting. I mean, when you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, especially a persistent one, you can essentially do anything you want. You can even overwrite the page that you have cross-site scripting on. So this is a nifty little attack. Um, it's just essentially emulating a LastPass, uh, the LastPass application. So when they view this page, it's going to say your LastPass session expired. So of course, what are they going to do? They're going to go log back into LastPass, right? And I was surprised when, when this actually did work when I was testing it. So they see their LastPass session expired. You go log in, and so now they're on the attack server. So now they're on our server, essentially entering their credentials, and you stole their LastPass credentials. So right here, we just capture, and I like doing this, where I capture like they hit the LastPass, they hit the login page, and then they log in. So you show the levels that people got to, especially pen testing, you can show how far the attack actually actually worked. Uh, so next, I want to show Devel and, or, and essentially how to harvest this information. So right here, we're just looking at our user account, so the test user and the, uh, the password hash. So now we're just verifying we can enumerate other users and we can access their accounts uh, with the Devel module enabled. So right here, we're just looking at the admin user's password hash. And you'd be surprised how often this thing is actually included in production sites. So this script is essentially the same format as the one we saw before. So we're going to plug in the URL that we're, we're attacking. And then uh, we're going to grab our cookie. And just set all the other parameters. So we're going to go for 30 accounts this time. So we're just going to go for all the accounts in the site. And you can kind of determine how many are there just by enumerating through. And so as quick as that, we have all the user, uh, the emails, and all the uh, password hashes. So now we can take those and go crack them. So this is my favorite part of Devel. This is my favorite feature within the whole module. So I walk you guys through, essentially, at this point, we have uh, admin access on the account. We'll just say we've got in through one of the other means, and we want to actually execute PHP code. Now, there are a few ways to do this. This way, I'm just going into the blocks, and I'm moving an inactive block up to an active block. So I'm taking the PHP code execution block and move it up to the footer. So now, down here in the footer, we have the uh, execute PHP code block. And so it gives us a nice little window to insert our exploit code, essentially. So first thing I like to do is just to test and make sure this thing really works and that I can actually uh, access files on the systems and, and execute PHP code. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to read the Etsy password file just to see if, it, see if it's working, see if I can read files. Um, so you just write PHP in this little window and you don't have to include the uh, opening and closing brackets. So. so right here you can see the results of our, of our uh, script there. So now let's check out that settings.php file. You know, the one we were looking at before that has the Drupal hash salt, MySQL credentials, all that good stuff. So we're going to read that file and grab out all the comments. So we're just getting the actual usable data. So right here, we got the database, username, password, and the, uh, and the host, along with the Drupal hash salt. So essentially, we have everything we would need to take over the application and uh, essentially crack all of the passwords that are the password hashes that we already have obtained. So next thing I like doing is generating a reverse shell. So I'm just using Metasploit payload and uh, I'm encoding it using a base64. So this just generates a big chunk of uh, base64 encoded text essentially. And so all we have to do is just plug this in and we fire up our handler on the other side and as soon as this executes we get a uh, reverse shell. And you can actually just run netcat here. Um, I was just using the, uh, the multi-handler just to show kind of the exploit we're using. And so once we fire this, you can see we have our, our shell. Now we're just checking to see uh, you know, who we are, where we're at in the, in the file system. 
So simple as that. Pretty pretty fun little little exploit. So with that, you know, I have just a couple closing closing thoughts about Drupal and security. Um, the main thing is, you know, do your research, understand your organizational architecture, understand your servers, your applications, and your log data. So you want to make sure you're pulling the right data in. So like if you have Drupal applications or other uh, content management systems, you want to make sure you're actually pulling in all the data so you get a full picture of your actual attack surface. And pen test your apps. You know, you don't want to just run scans. Like scans are good. They'll find you know low hanging fruit, SQL injection, cross site scripting kind of stuff. Um, not persistent cross site scripting too often. That's a tricky one for scanners to pick up. Um, but you want to you want to do full pen tests. You want to actually test your code manually. Um, update early and often. Make sure apply updates. And embed security within development from the beginning. You want to actually work with developers, and developers need to work with you guys. You know, the more you come together and actually know what each side is doing, the more secure your company is going to be in the end. And so, in addition, I have a, a much longer version of this that goes a lot deeper into remediation and, and that kind of stuff on my uh, GitHub page right here. So, um, and that's all I have. Thank you guys for coming, and I'm around all day if you guys have questions. So. Right. What are we doing on time? We might have time. Oh, nope.